Uh, um, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so now we're going to chapter 5 of Double Grape. So, let me find chapter 5. You know, this, this book, I didn't put, I didn't put numbers on the pages. So, you know, I, I just, I just remember which illustration is where. And why would I want to know exactly where which page is? Because, you know, I can turn pages. Anyway, yeah, chapter 5. So this, this illustration is of somebody who's going to be of great importance in this chapter and maybe the rest of the book. I don't know. Because, uh, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't write it with any sort of you know, wish to make some sort of story, this you know, amazing story. I just had two months on my hand. I wanted more, you know, but yeah, it ended in two months. Now I have nothing to do but read. Zoe is a tired soul. Here in her quarters, there sit on the modular shelves, canvas panels, artistically dedicated to, the, to many of her thoughts, fancies, and dreams. There is a work depicting the horned man from the restaurant, whom she met very nearly two years ago, and with she has a purely fanciful relationship, however shared. Her fascination with the demon in the picture is nothing but artistic, and it clouds her desire to see him again. She is somewhat confused, having grown from the simple, careworthy creature with no parents, to the experienced individual before the canvas in front of her, and never once meeting along the way someone who could appreciate her in the primitive ways that he does. <clears throat> she goes to the restaurant in the afternoon without her friendly group of patrons, sits in the second bar stool, and waits for the demon to finish his shift. He does, and sits next to her, noticing that the darting of her eyes has lessened, and her mouth hangs open so gently as to beg for a voice. We need to get out of here. She looks him in the eyes with a seemingly exaggerated worry. The information is simple and overwhelming. What do you mean? Of this restaurant. Let's leave. She discards a bit of polite privacy. Let's go to your place. <coughs> the couple walks down the street from the center tower to the arboretum. He guides her away from the jungle and into a side street. The heat in their bodies grows stronger and stronger until the furry thing can barely walk, and the demon, with his huge, sturdy build, carries the small creature toward the market street, blue tarps on the left, red on the right, and the bench in the middle. The night has come, and the feeling of slumber is in the air. When they elevate from the ground to the hoodoo building and make their way to his northeast-facing room, he lies on the bed. She creeps her taut legs in his direction, hops them atop his tough, thick frame, and paws at his heaving chest. His claws push down on the small of her back as her feet caress his shins. He begins to huff and growl. <clears throat> the east wall of Timothy's room is letting pass through the noise of desire. The homosexual canid awakes from his quiet days in bed to find his laptop running and the noise radiating from his neighbor's room. He rises in the hopes that he might hear any mention of either his name or a flattering physical description. Slumber and security has made him ready enough, and as soon as he hears the shouting from his neighbor, he is confused. Who's a good girl? John huffs. Timothy is not a girl unless John is feeling a little confused, which he is not now. I am, strains a second voice behind the wall. Timothy catches his breath and lets himself go. He has been beaten by someone else to the unholy grail of the horned man. I'm your good girl. The voice is not recognizable. Timothy has never met Zoe. She lives far across the complex in the permanent residential blocks, 
He doesn't know who she is and doesn't care. He simply hates her for stealing his chances. This walk in the Arboretum is different. Timothy and John sit on the same bench in front of the Redwood, facing the foyer path. Timothy is quietly thinking away the fear of creating a possibly extensive series of questions and statements, which he would be better off keeping to himself. John, he finally asks, we're friends, friends and neighbors, right? Well, yes, like you could put it that way, I guess. Are we possibly, his fate tightens as he says, more than friends? John lightly sighs and bows his head gently. He physically holds his dear friend close, as they had been sitting closer and closer with every visit to the bench, trying to emulate the emotional contact he experiences with the candid man. I've always felt something. His heart is provoked by the image of Timothy staring straight at him, eager for an addition to the answer, long muzzle twitching, ears folding back and forth. You do know what I mean, don't you? Yes. John confirms and adds, though I haven't always thought about it, I've had a weird feeling. He looks him directly in the eye. I've felt it a lot more in the recent years. I've felt it here. <coughs> it's okay, says Timothy, placing his paw on John's shoulder, which John, after waiting a few seconds, snatches in his claw. What are you doing? I don't know. He sits back on the bench and releases the paw. Timothy wraps furry arms around pinkish-green shoulders, stroking the tough, smooth skin. It's okay. Before he was admitted, Timothy was fully CompTIA certified. He acquired digital copies of the latest exam guides as of 2100 and read them all through twice. His human parents encouraged that he read something worthwhile. Surprised at how quickly he picked up the English language, let alone three massive textbooks. He ran into a few bad crowds at school. One fun night at a friend's apartment in Flagstaff, he slurped a little too much of the passing alcohol, banged another drunk dude on the head with a lamp, and fell asleep in a mixture of vomit, piled-up partygoers, and glitter. After he became involved in a condition so considerably dire, the mick was the closest and most preferable solution. The folks understood that he would be met with the utmost reasoning, care, and love, deserved and shared by all other inmates and staff. Now, with all his valuable certifications, he is technically qualified for the positions held by computer technicians and engineers as staff members, but is consequently unable to even very openly consider any of those positions due to his current admission. Those positions are held in office levels and workshops throughout the gigantic pillars of obsidian buildings supporting the ceiling of the complex. The buildings stretch concave girders diagonal to the walls, parallel with skylights, and from which dangle the massive lamps which light the way from the highest platforms to the modular overhangs at the mid-level of the wall. At the bottom of each of these buildings guard their entrances, entrances computerized security automatons armed with retractable air cannons, capable of producing ear-splitting noise, well as knocking someone far back behind where they stand. Beside the shutters which protect the entranceways, bolted to the concrete are chip readers, like the one at the jacked cactus, and the ones inside the automaton's heads. The automatons search for chips, located in the right dexterous extremity of everyone inside the complex. Chips designated with staff member access properties are free to let the chip reader by the entrance open the shutters, and chips designated with inmate access properties will have their journey to the door interrupted by a metal hand and a woofing klaxon. If not for the automatons, an inmate chip won't open the shutters with its access codes in the first place. <coughs> not everywhere is overlooked by these machines. There are virtually none in the streets, save for those by the entrance to the towers, and only one is required per residential block, and at least three or four per setup of blocks. The mission where John and Timothy live is home to one at the roof of their hoodoo and four others at the corners of other blocks, blocks raised by elevator shaft structures and connected by tunnel walkways. These are the nice quarters of the south side. 
when the automatons read when the automatons read the coded chips they first flash a red LED on the front of the plates around their computer brains the process takes a few seconds and during these seconds an emitter channel is open in the chip reading mechanism which receives the data viewed on the chip it is a small amount of data enough so that a log of as many and which chips have been re read is stored inside a 512 gigabyte solid drive in the computer the logs are cleaned as soon as a technician clears any important things such as a read of an inmate that went unnoticed and was logged more than once this might mean that there is a dead or injured inmate somewhere or that the defense programming in the computer is faulty or fails to communicate with the air cannon mechanisms. Computer technicians and engineers in the workshops there where these machines are upkept are all fully CompTIA certified, just like Timothy. He and John are currently privileged spectators to stress testing one of these automatons. <coughs> the bulky machine is covered in metal plates like a contemporary simplification of those on an ancient Milanese night. An experienced IT staff member stands beside it on the transport platform in the high mission block, with the heavy air cannon retracted from its torso slot and dismounted from its kickback arm. This is a government-issued civil protection approved non-lethal air rifle, nicknamed the Air Hard Gun by its team of developers. The equipment lumbers in the arms of Stephen, the computer technical and engineering staff for the block setup. It's also wearing my leverage down by about 25 pounds. When any of you like to hold it, don't touch the trigger, Stephen chuckles. John raises his left claw as the tech walks over to him and hands him the gun. He's been thinking about which button is the manual trigger and thinks now that he knows which. John is not exactly totally under control and neither does he know the truth about which button is which. He recently has been holding out away from Zoe. He wants to do some damage. As he handles the gun like it's nothing, grabbing a hold with his left of the handlebar underneath the long hexagonal prism of the barrel, and with his right of the triggers on the box behind it, Timothy raises his right hand in front of him with a pleading, Don't! Wait! No! As soon as he presses the sonic suppression trigger. When Timothy raised his hand, the computer on the automaton read the chip within a few seconds. Within little shorter time, John was able to press the button that would not throw the group over the railing of the platform, but which triggers an ear-splitting noise. Timothy had covered his ears after remembering an online article about modern weapons read just 12 hours before. The demon was behind the emission, but Stephen lies dead on the platform, having fallen by the jolt of the awful screech and then smashed his temple on the foot of the giant metal contraption. Not only is the technician lost, but so is the chip reader and the computer behind the plate with the red LED. The sonic suppression emission is more than enough to overload the emitter channel in any standard chip reader. What the fuck, John? Timothy is not pleasantly surprised by the turn of the situation. Now we need to get the fuck out of here! Just one little thing that I need, and we can get the get out of here for sure. John knows about the chips. There is no legal way for even government workers to plant a chip inside someone and not tell them all they need to about it. He reaches for the late Stephen's right hand and severs it with his sharp nails, as holding out has been due not only to missing Zoe, but also to not having groomed himself properly. All right, let's, let's do what you... Let's get the fuck out of here, right? And that is the end of chapter five. And so, uh, yeah, I guess we just stop this video.